Hey there, all you beautiful Broadway babies. Welcome back to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani, and I am so thrilled to bring you guys another Broadway breakdown. If you're new to this channel, welcome. In these breakdowns, I take a look at the rich history of some almost forgotten Broadway and off-Broadway musicals of yesteryear, and also give you a full, sometimes overly detailed plot breakdown so you can get a better understanding of the show that you may not ever get to see performed live anytime soon, and so that you can enjoy the original cast recordings of these shows with the full context of the story. I've got some fun things coming to the channel, including all new Schmigadoon, or should I say Schmicago content coming, so make sure you're subscribed. But enough shameless shilling, for now anyways, let's dive into today's Forgotten Flop musical. I'm very excited. John Kander and Fred Ebb had one of the most beloved and long-lasting partnerships in musical theater history. Composer John Kander and lyricist and book writer Fred Ebb burst onto the scene as a duo in 1965 with the musical Flora the Red Menace, starring a 19-year-old Liza Minnelli making her Broadway debut. And the duo followed that up with the masterpiece Cabaret in 1966. They contributed several iconic shows to the musical theater canon, including Zorba, Woman of the Year, and Chicago, the revival of which is set to become the longest-running show on Broadway when Phantom closes later this year. Kander and Ebb have also written a slew of less successful musicals, many of which have a cult following, like The Rink, Steel Pier, there's a breakdown of on the channel, you can check that out after this, the Visit, and The Scottsboro Boys. All told, the team had 14 musicals reach the Great Bright Way, three of which were notably produced after Fred Ebb's death in 2004. The show we're exploring today definitely falls into that less successful but with a cult following group, 1971's 70 Girls 70. Oh, well, hello, 70. 70 Girl 70 is based off the 1958 play Breath of Spring by Peter Koch, which was adapted into the 1960 British comedy film Make Mine Mink. As has been the case with several Broadway musicals, such as Applause and A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, the authors originally intended to adopt the film version, here Make Mine Mink, but legal reasons forced them to officially adapt the basis novel or play of the film. But whether based on Make My Mink or the original play, there were many major changes made to the story. So the producers and authors' assertion that 70 Girl 70 is only very loosely based on the source material holds up as true. Our story concerns a group of tenants in a crumbling residential hotel in then-present-day New York City, all of whom are somewhere between the ages of 60 and 80, and the not-so-legal lengths they go to to help their building and their fellow tenants. The show opened on April 15th, 1971 at the Broadhurst Theatre, current home to A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond jukebox bio-musical. The cast assembled, which all but one were eligible for Social Security, was comprised of beloved character actors and actresses from the early years of Broadway and Hollywood. Leading the ensemble was Mildred Natwick. Natwick appeared in dozens of Broadway shows, creating the roles of Mrs. Banks in Barefoot in the Park and Madame Arcati in the original Blythe Spirit. Natwick also appeared in small but memorable roles in scores of films, including The Quiet Man, The Trouble with Harry, and recreating her stage role in the film version of Barefoot in the Park, earning her an Academy Award nomination. Also in the cast was Lillian Roth, who had roles in the films The Love Parade, The Vagabond King, Alice Sweet Alice, and Animal Crackers with the Marx Brothers. Her autobiography was even made into the 1954 film All Cry Tomorrow, starring Susan Hayward. As well as Lillian Heyman, who earned a Tony nomination for the musical Hallelujah Baby, and played Sadie Gray on the long-running soap opera One Life to Live, appearing on that show from 1968 to 1986. Vaudevillian Joey Fay, who put his old-school comedy skills to use on Broadway in the musicals Top Banana, Little Me, and Grind, plus he claimed to have invented the famous comedy routine, Slowly I Turned, made immortal in the sitcom I Love Lucy. Should have met me before you met my... Oh. 
I almost said Martha. <laughs> Speaking of I Love Lucy, also in the cast was one of my favorite character actors, Hans Conried, who appeared twice in memorable roles in I Love Lucy, once as the junk dealer Mr. Jenkins, and later as Mr. Livermore, an English teacher who got to be part of this hilarious bit. And as I tippy-tippy-toe along, all the pretty flowers seem to sing this song. Dairy down, pip, pip. Dilly, dilly, day. Hey, nanny, nanny. Rippity, pippity, hey. But today, Hans Conried is most famous for his voice, having provided the vocals for Snidely Whiplash in the Dudley Do Right cartoons, the narrator and Horton in the original Horton Hears a Who feature, and most notably, Captain Hook in Disney's Peter Pan. On the creative team side of 70 Girl 70, Kander and Ab originally brought several of their collaborators from Cabaret along for the fairly bumpy ride to Broadway. Ron Field, Cabaret's choreographer, was brought on to direct early on, and though his time on the project was short, he left a large and somewhat detrimental impression on the musical, but more on that towards the end. Ron Fields was replaced with Paul Aaron, who, even though he retained the directorial credit, he himself was replaced after the show's disastrous tryout in Philadelphia with Stanley Prager, who was billed as production supervised by. The choreography was by the great Ona White. The book writer was to be Joe Masteroff, who had written the book for Cabaret. He adapted the movie slash play into a straightforward plot-driven evening. At some point, however, Masteroff left the project and Fred Ebb, along with Norman L. Martin, took up the book duties and made the evening less straightforward and more... weird. Weird? Like, weird out. The show was now half book musical and half vaudeville, with the action moving back and forth between the story and, as the program stated, the stage of the Broadhurst Theater, where 70 Girl 70 was playing. Confused? Yeah, so were most of the critics, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. There is so much more backstory and history about this show to share, from why this show opened at the worst time possible, to by far the most dramatic and tragic out-of-town cast change in musical theater history. But before I dive into all that, let's first break down the plot of this sweet, odd little show from the beginning of Broadway's Silver Age. So put on your suspenders and support hose, warm yourself a cup of Ovaltine, and let's get cracking. <laughs> oh, my back! The show opens not in the world of our story, but the real world, the stage of the Broadhurst Theater, New York City. The stage is empty, save for a few benches where a group of older, beloved character actors of yesteryear are seated. One man takes out a harmonica and plays Happy Birthday. As he plays, the actors begin to take out their birth certificates and show them to the audience, proclaiming the year they were born. When the man finishes playing his harmonica, he calls off stage, Hit it, Lorraine! And a woman, quite elderly like the others, is brought on stage right with an upright piano where she'll be for most of the show. She begins to play the opening number, where our cast sing directly to the audience, telling them what they are decidedly not, which is old folks. Old folks latch a lot, though it doesn't mean a thing. Yawn and stretch a lot, rolling on an inner spring. Cough and fetch a lot, sign one perpetual sign. When the number ends, we begin our story at the Cornucopia Cafe, which is located in the lobby of the Sussex Arms, a rundown senior citizen residence hotel in Manhattan's Upper West Side. We meet waitresses Melba and Fritzi, also in their 60s, and Melba talks to the audience, setting the mood for the evening. What did I say? Talk to the audience? Oh God, this is always death. She looks at one of the empty tables, soon to be full of old folks, and laments, 
I bet the last supper they all had was the last supper. She then says to the audience, I bet you're wondering why I'm talking to you. Well, get used to it. We'll be doing this all night. We talk when we want to, sing when we want to, use Lorraine when we want to, all while telling you a story. So if you don't want to be confused, pay attention. Attention must be paid. Gert, a no-nonsense gal, arrives first, followed by Lovebirds, Eunice and Walter, and then Harry. The foursome all wonder where Ida, the woman who called them all together for a meal, on her no less, could be. Harry says, I hope she gets here soon. I don't like eating this late. Ruins my schedule. I like being over my gas attacks by 8.30, 9 at the latest. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that old people joke humor throughout the show. What can you expect? The group discusses Ida and how she suddenly left the Sussex Arms without a word three months ago, and Melba remarks to the audience that this is all just exposition. Does pointing out that it's just exposition make it less lazy? <laughs> Harry wonders how Ida will look, and Gert says she'll look how she always looks. She'll come clomping in in those dumb black shoes, those horrible support hose, and that old tangerine dress just like she always wore as the old fogies wonder how the constantly cash-strapped Ida could possibly pay for the five of them to eat dinner, Ida makes her grand entrance into the cafe. She is not the dowdy lady they remember, but instead dressed to the nines in a sleek black cocktail dress, a white ermine fur, and dripping with diamonds. Melba, Fritzy, and the group all rush to greet her, telling her how unbelievable she looks. Ida tells Lorraine to give her a little rumba music, and she sings Home. Home is where my heart is, and I'm home. I know where my heart is, I came home. I found other faces, I filled other spaces, but no other place is quite like home. Everyone wants to know what the heck Ida's been up to since she left. Before Ida tells them, she asks the waitresses, Melba and Fritzy, to leave them for a minute. She tells the audience they're not supposed to hear this part. It's part of the plot. After they go, the gang huddles together and Ida tells them the tale. She says she left because she was very sick and didn't want to have to say goodbye to everyone. She tried to get into the hospital, but no luck, it was all full. She decided that as she was going out, she was gonna go out in style. So she pawned everything she had and checked into the Waldorf Hotel. The Waldorf Hotel, huh? Once there, she still felt very sick and was convinced she had a temperature, but she didn't have a thermometer. So she went down to the drugstore to pick one up. But when she tried to hand it to the clerk to pay, he said, hold your horses, granny. What the did you just say to me? She was so incensed by that comment that the next thing she knew, she was out on the street with the now stolen thermometer in hand. The group is shocked. That's terrible, Walter says. No, Walter, it was wonderful, says Ida. She says she felt so exhilarated, her heart was going boom diddy boom diddy boom. By the time she got back to her room, she felt so good she didn't need the thermometer at all. The next night, she even returned to the drugstore and swiped an electric hair curling set, a sun lamp, and two boxes of Phenomint, which, thanks to this show, I now know is a laxative gum. Don't you know what this is? My gum, it's gum! Wrong! And again, she says, her heart went boom diddy boom diddy boom And she figured if all this small stuff could make her feel so good, imagine how good she feel when she begins to escalate. Soon, she was visiting high-end stores like Lord & Taylor's and Bergdorf's with her five-finger discount. She goes on to say that whatever she doesn't keep, she sells for a profit. The group is shocked, to say the least. But Ida has one last little bomb to drop. She tells them she's been thinking about how much she misses everyone, and how sad it is they all just sit around the hotel, bored and depressed like she used to be. But... It doesn't have to be like that. If one person can do so well on this racket, imagine what five people could do. She says they'd all come alive like she has, and the Sussex Arms could be a palace overnight. Gert, who used to be a store security guard, says she doesn't want to get arrested. Who arrests old people, asks Ida. Who even notices old people? 
The only old people in jail are the ones who were young when they went in. After a long, contemplative pause, they all refuse one by one to join Ida. Ida says, well, at least she tried, and she tells them she'll stay the night and they can all catch up just like old times, and the gang, or not gang, sing a little reprise of Home. We are now no longer in the story, but in the real world at the Broadhurst Theater. Very meta. Is it though? Anyways, the actresses who play Melba and Fritzy address the audience and say, for all those people in the play, the Sussex Arms is home. But for us actors, the stage is our home. They cue up Lorraine, still sitting at her upright piano, stage right, and the pair sing Broadway, My Street. So it's cold out. Show me a sign that says we're sold out. And see me licking my heels to show the gang how warm it feels back here on my feet. Broadway, my street. Suicide or riding high street Broadway, I'm in a daze That's every night at seven plus the two matinees Back in the story, it's the morning after the failed recruitment and Ida is packing up her suitcase. The bellhop, Eddie, who's 19, the only person not over the hill in the show, is there to help her with her bag. He remarks how he misses her and how impressed he is with her new duds. Soon, a frantic Harry enters and tells Ida he needs to speak to her now, alone. Eddie leaves, and Ida asks, what's the matter? Harry opens the door and signals off stage. Soon, Gert enters, followed by Eunice, in a stunning new mink coat. Where did you get that? Ida asks. Eunice says, let me put it to you this way. Boom, diddy, boom, diddy, boom. She stole it. Ida is delighted, and Eunice explains that she was up all night thinking about what Ida had said. That morning, she took a walk and found herself in front of Sadie's first store. She went in to try on some coats. Sadie got a phone call and went into the back room to answer it. And the next thing she knew, she was in the street with the hot mink. But then Gert drops the bad news. Eunice didn't want to leave an empty hanger, so she left her old coat there, and it has her name sewed into the lining. <laughs> With not wanting Eunice to get caught, plus Ida says they shouldn't steal from local people like Sadie, only big stores. They need to figure out a plan to switch the coats back without Sadie noticing. Also, Walter, Eunice's fiance, doesn't know about what happened at the first store, and Eunice doesn't want him to, since Walter was the most horrified by Ida's thieving. Harry locks the door, and they get to planning. Ida says all they have to do is have someone in the store, then have someone else call Sadie so she'll go in the back room again, switch the coats, and they're out in five minutes. Eunice, though, is a little slow on the uptake, and Ida says, oh, Eunice, do we have to draw you a diagram? Ida's room disappears, and a large diagram of Sadie's store is lowered center stage. Harry appears, pointer in hand, and to the audience sings the rapid-fire patter song, The Caper. SS Sadie's store, SB Sadie's back, SF Sadie's front, OS operational site, G1 telephone 1, T2 telephone 2, T3 telephone 3, R1 rack 1, R2 rack 2, OC old coat, X units A, Ida B, Gerd S, Sadie H, Harry. Next, we find Ida, Gert, Eunice, and Harry about to put the caper into action. They go over the plan yet again. Eunice will check out Sadie's to make sure it's empty and give a signal to Ida to go into the store. Gert will be on lookout to make sure no one goes in, and Harry is stationed at the nearby phone booth to make the call to Sadie's. Now, there's all these little bits of business that happen. Ida has these little asides directly to the audience, Eunice starts to walk the wrong way. Harry runs over with half a phone receiver because the payphone is broken. Basically, to just make us all nervous that things are not going to go well. Oh dear. How uneasy I feel. The set for Sadie's first salon comes on, and it's go time. Eunice gives the all-clear signal, so Ida enters the store and Sadie comes out from the back room. 
Ida is having to kill some time since Harry has to go find a working payphone a little farther away, and there's this whole little scene where Ida is trying to decide between a mink or chinchilla fur coat, and of course Sadie is trying to make the sale any way she can. Anxious to get the plan rolling, Ida finally asks Sadie if she wouldn't mind going to check on her phone in the back room to make sure it's working. She says she's expecting a call from her chauffeur, and he should have called by now. Sadie obliges and heads to the back room, and Ida frantically starts checking the racks of coats for Eunice's, but there's not enough time, and Sadie comes back on, saying the phone is, of course, working fine. They go back to the mink versus chinchilla debate until Ida says, uh, Sadie, I think your phone is ringing. You better go check it. And though Sadie says she doesn't hear anything, she goes into the back to check anyways. Ida anxiously checks more racks, and then suddenly Harry, Eunice, and Gert frantically rush in saying, dimes, dimes, we need dimes, you know, to make the phone call. You guys, f Ida hurries them out just as Sadie comes back from the back room. Having to think on her feet, Ida faints. Sadie rushes to her in a panic, and Ida meekly says, Water. I need water. Sadie goes into the back to get her some water. Ida leaps up to her feet and scours the rack some more, but still not enough time. Ida quickly gets back on the floor, and Sadie comes back with the water. Ida says, I think I know what happened. I forgot to eat. Would you mind ordering me some food? So this goes on for some time with Sadie going to the back room to order the food, Ida scouring the rack, Sadie coming back in, and Ida keeps sending her out with one menial task after another. Finally, Ida finds the right coat, makes the switch, but before she can make it out of the store, Sadie comes from the back room one more time. Ida tells Sadie to call the food place back one more time to make sure her coffee won't come in a cardboard cup. Doctor's orders. With a deep sigh, Sadie goes to the back room one more time, and Ida makes her escape. Yeah, so I'm relieved. That was an ordeal. Yeah. It was nuts. Next, we are out of the story and in the theater in real time. Fritzy and Melba enter and explain to the audience what a crossover is, which is basically so that the set and or costumes can be changed backstage. With no more setup than that, they sing the incredibly catchy song, Coffee in a Cardboard Cup. The trouble of the world today, it seems to me, is coffee in a cardboard cup. The trouble with the affluent society is coffee in a cardboard cup. No one's ever casual and nonchalant. No one wastes a minute in a restaurant. No one wants a waitress passing pleasantries like I am this. May I take your order, please? The trouble with the world today is plain to see. Yes, everything is hurry up. It's rush it through. And don't be slow. And BLT. On the ride to go. With coffee. I think she said. Coffee. I know she said. Coffee. In a cardboard cup. That one is going to lodge into your brain for a long time. Mark my words. Back in the rundown lobby of the Sussex Arms, Young Eddie is seated at his desk as a pair of older residents, Mr. and Mrs. McIlhenny, come down to the lobby. Mrs. McIlhenny asks Eddie to turn on the TV for them, and Eddie says, Sure, but you know it's not working. There's no picture. Mrs. McIlhenny says, Oh, that doesn't matter. He likes to look at it anyways. Eddie asks what he sees, and she says, Anything he wants to see. And the husband and wife sing, You and I Love. I can see a fashion show I don't like the midi length The Mets are winning 3-2-1 The infield shows a lot of strength Johnny Carson's lots of fun I'm really very fond of him Who's the guest on Griffin's show? Oh, oh my God, God it's, it's Tiny Tim, Tim. You and I love, you and I Take each minute for what's in it as it's spinning by As the song continues, other residents of the arms come down and sing about what they see in the pictureless television. It's really rather sweet. The residents slowly leave, Eddie turns off the TV, and he exits as well.
Ida, Gert, Harry, and Eunice enter in a rush of adrenaline and joy. They all compliment each other and gush about how well they all did and how incredible they all feel now. Woo! My blood is pumping, my endorphins are flowing. Endorphins. I feel alive! Harry, Gert, and Eunice all decide to keep going and join Ida in her thievery. There's one problem for Eunice though, her beloved Walter still doesn't know and certainly would not approve. Ida assures her there is no way Walter will find out. On cue, Walter enters. The newly formed gang doesn't have their poker faces on and panic a bit. Walter says to Eunice that he hasn't seen her all day. Ida and the rest of the gang decide to go to the Cornucopia Diner and leave a very nervous Eunice alone with Walter. Walter says that she looks upset and asks what's wrong. Eunice is elated that it seems that Walter is not on to her, so she says that she's just upset because Ida can't be talked out of her shoplifting and she's just so worried for her. And Walter says, just so long as you have no part of it, which of course she denies being, and the pair declare their love for each other and embrace. Walter suddenly breaks the long hug and he and Eunice address the audience directly. They accuse the audience members of all wondering one thing, whether or not they, and old people in general, have, you know... Sex. Sex. The pair sing, Do We. Do we? Do we? That's what you want to know, isn't it? Do we? Do we? That's what disturbs you so, isn't it? You sit there wondering, what are those two all about? Do we? That's for us to know and you to find out. At the end of the number, Walter blows Eunice a kiss and leaves. Ida, Harry, and Gert come back on, and Eunice excitedly tells them that Walter is still in the dark, which is just what they want. They can still commit their crimes, and Walter will assume it's only Ida bringing in the cash. They plan to spend every dime they make on fixing up the Sussex arms, save for a few wardrobe pieces for themselves. After all, Gert says, you can't rip off Bergdorf's in rags. They envision the Sussex Arms as a haven for old people with no money to live free and be taken care of when no one else gives a damn. All for one and one for all, they proclaim, and they cue up our favorite onstage upright piano player in the song, Hit It, Lorraine. We're gonna take this town and turn it upside down, go on and hit it, Lorraine. To celebrate the glee that's bubbling up in me Go on and hit it, Lorraine We are now in Bloomingdale's fur salon My mom calls it Bloomies Where several mannequins are wearing exquisite fur coats Gert enters, clearly on lookout duty Followed by Harry pushing a clothing rack with a cover over it He pushes the rack in front of one of the mannequins And when he moves it again, the mannequin is naked just as everything seems to be going according to plan, four security guards enter and three of them were old co-workers of Gert's. Remember, she used to be a store security guard, apparently at Bloomingdale's. The fourth is a new guy. Gert pretends she's doing a little shopping and tries to give her old buddies the brush off, but when they notice the naked mannequin, they start to leave to get a manager. So Gert distracts them by asking if they've seen any of the old crowd lately. They tell her, hey, Louie the Lift was in here yesterday. Louie. Eager to get on with the heist, Gert tries to brush off her old friends again, but they tell her they're in no rush, they're on their lunch break. It's clear the men aren't leaving anytime soon, so when one of them asks Gert if she's seen any of the old crowd, she says, yeah, Emma Finch. Playing right into Gert's hands, Phil, the new guy, asks who Emma Finch is and Gert cues up Lorraine, and she and the security guard sing, See the Light. Emma, listen to the story of Emma, listen to the story of Emma. Emma saw a poochie and Emma, cleared the bin. Emma Finch walked out of Bloomy's way, ten pounds more than when Emma walked in. Emma, like a lemma, would tiptoe left to right. Emma's one dilemma was the poochie and never could see the light. 
Of course, as the song plays out, the rack is moved from mannequin to mannequin, each one becoming unceremoniously stripped, but it goes unnoticed by the guards deep in their song. The guards and first door disappear after the number, and we are back in the lobby of the Sussex Arms, though it's a palace compared to what it once was. A beautiful chandelier is lowered, and we can see the lobby now boasts a lush new couch and rocking chairs, fresh flowers everywhere, and five or six brand new TV sets scattered throughout the room. Eddie enters in a bright new bellhop's uniform with a silver tea service and brings it to Harry, Eunice, and Ida, who are sitting on the sofa. Gert is running late, but they decide to start their little meeting of the masterminds without her. First order of business, their financial condition. Harry opens his ledger and announces that since the first day of their operation, which was two months and six days ago, they have acquired 14 minks, four chinchillas, eight beavers, two Russian broadtails, 16 seals, and one phony Persian lamb, he says with a dirty look at Eunice. Dang. That's a lot. He tells them they've sold the merchandise for a total of $60,831.36. Total expenses during that time? $60,824.19. Cash on hand? $7.17. The money has all gone to refurbishing the Sussex Arms and paying the rent for everyone living there. They decide they've just got to make more money. Before the conversation can continue, however, waitresses Fritzy and Melba enter. They tell the group that somebody bought the Cornucopia Diner, and come Friday, they'll both be out of a job and flat broke. The pair ask if there's any room at the Sussex Arms. They say that they plan to help out, though, and earn their share, and then Melba says she knows what they've all been up to, and her and Fritzy want in and to be a part of the gang. Ida just says, I won't even ask you how you know, you want to join, so welcome to the club. Which, I guess is one way to avoid plot holes, just say, well, let's not ask any follow-up questions. Anyways, Gert then enters with Edna and Marvin Whitaker, who are in their 70s, of course, and Gert tells the group she thinks she's found two live ones. Edna Whitaker introduces herself and her husband, and tells them that they are currently living with their daughter and her husband, who's a jerk, adds Marvin, and they've heard that they take in old people here. Ida asks them if they have any income or savings. They reply no, and Ida tells Harry to check them into room 238. Harry hands them their key, their complimentary fruit basket and bottle of champagne, and the Whitakers head up to their new abode to applause from the entire room. With Gert now there, they try to begin their meeting again when Walter enters, looking distraught. Eunice asks what's wrong, and he tells her he knows about everything. The gang, the shoplifting, the whole operation. Again, with no explanation of how he found out, which Ida even comments on, saying, did we send out announcements or something? Does making a joke about it make it any less lazy? There's some some really big plot holes that need to be explained. Walter begs them all to stop, but they are incredulous. Why would we stop? Look at the place, look at the people. Besides, it's got nothing to do with you, Walter. But Walter tells them that's not exactly true. He then confesses that he is in fact an ex-con. Walter, no! He used to be what they called a box man, which is a safe cracker, and one of the best around too, he brags. And if they all get caught, there's no way the police would believe he wasn't a part of it, and he'd be sent back to prison for another 10 years. I can't afford 10 days, he says. He begs them, saying that he knows they're doing this to help old people, but he's an old person too. Man, that's a tough one. After a long, thoughtful pause, Ida agrees that they have no choice, they have to stop. They'll just have to turn any new people away and let anyone already there stay only till the end of the month. Harry and Gert don't want to stop, however, but Ida holds firm. She says they must stop, even if the sweetest, most pathetic, oldest little old lady came through that door with the wind howling and the snow blowing, and she had the oldest dog on God's green earth with her. There is a knock at the door, and the sweetest little old lady anyone's ever seen enters with the wind blowing behind her and snow covering her head, and carrying the cutest little old dog with her. 
She says, I have no money and I hear you take care of old people. But Ida tells her she's sorry, but she's just in the wrong place. Try the Salvation Army 12 blocks from there. She tries to rush the old lady out the door, but the little old lady just doesn't move. And Ida asks, why is she just standing there? Can't she hear me? Who is this woman? And Harry answers that it's his mother. That I was not expecting. Harry starts to escort his mother out, but Walter can't take it anymore. He says, Ida, wait. Ida looks at the audience and smiles. She addresses the audience and says that it's pretty clear they'll be going back at it in the second act. But what you don't know is how Walter will figure into it or whether or not they'll be caught. That stuff, she says, is what's called cliffhangers. To be continued. Curtain falls, end of act one. Intermission! And you know what you do at intermission, right? That's right, Grandma. You subscribe to this channel and like this video. Do it now while I'm talking about it and we're taking a little break. I've got so much fun stuff coming to the channel, Prop Table Tuesdays every week, and plus, oh, oh well, can't get to all that now. Act two is about to start. Let's get back into it. Act two begins on the empty stage. Ida stands center stage and is slowly joined by Gert, Eunice, Harry, Walter, Fritzy, and Melba, and they all sing Boom Diddy Boom. Did you catch all those lyrics? Should I run it again? No? You're good? As the song ends, we find ourselves at the Arctic Cold Storage Vault, where presumably many luxurious furs are kept. The freezing gang all crouch behind Walter, who has his ear pressed to the safe and is doing his best to crack it, but it's clear it's not going well. He tries the door one more time, but it won't budge. Walter is defeated, and Ida tries to encourage him and tells him to give it another go. But Walter says he just can't. He used to be able to break into a safe in 10 minutes, and he's been working on this one for over an hour. He says he should have brought dynamite, though a good box man like he used to be wouldn't even dream of bringing dynamite to a job. Walter is distraught, and Melba tells him the only trouble is, is that he doesn't believe in himself. She cues up Lorraine and Melba and the rest of the gang sing Believe. But you're so loud I can't hear the tumblers. Walter feels confident and thinks it's done, but when he pulls the door, nothing happens. Ah, oh, damn it! <laughs> Melba takes charge, slowly walks over to the door, yells at it to open up, gives it a big kick, and the door swings wide open. As the gang cheerfully files into the vault, which is indeed jam-packed with expensive furs, they grab all they can and stuff them into sacks. Harry stops to try on a coat that caught his fancy. He tries to see his reflection in the back of the vault door, but can't quite get the angle right, so he adjusts the door until it shuts firmly. Everyone freezes in shock, and Harry realizes what he's just done. Whoops. Ida calmly walks to the door and tries to open it, but no luck. She even looks at Melba, and Melba tries one of her amazing kicks again, but the door is locked tight. Everyone panics, and Ida calls for everyone to be quiet. She says, I got you into this mess, I'll get you out. Ida then walks down to the front of the stage to assure the audience that they'll be fine. She says if they all die now, it'll only be a seven minute second act. That's true. She says her pride is going to get them out, because when you have pride, you don't want to lose. And when you don't want to lose, you think ahead, which means... She fishes around in her sack and pulls out a few sticks of dynamite. Why she would have the dynamite ahead of time, I don't know. 
She hands the dynamite sticks to Walter, who asks why she didn't give it to him before. Ida says because she wanted to show him he was still as good as he always was. Walter starts to set up the dynamite to blow the vault door, saying it can be tricky. Too little and it won't work. Too much and they'll be blown to kingdom come. The gang brace themselves and sing a little reprise of Believe, and on the final chord, there's a blackout with the sound of a loud explosion. We now leave the story once again and are on the stage of the Broadhurst Theater when the actor who plays Eddie the Bellhop comes on. He tells the audience that that was a pretty big explosion, and since the show is all old people, it takes them a little while to recover. So he, being the only young person in the cast, has come out to sing a song about what he thinks the show is about. So he and an unidentified woman meant to represent everyone's grandmother sing Go Visit. Go visit your grandmother And you might even bring her flowers Go and take her out for a walk Or maybe you'll talk for hours and hours I'm obsessed with the way that woman says flowers and hours. Obsessed. In the lobby of the Sussex Arms, Ida sits going over the ledger while the rest of the gang are seated around the room, bundled in blankets and robes, all fighting ferocious colds from being locked in the Arctic cold storage vault. Suddenly, Eddie the Bellhop rushes in in a panic and tells everyone that the cops just parked outside and they're on their way in. Oh no! It's the Popo! Everyone initially freaks out, but Ida takes charge. She tells Eddie to wait outside since this has nothing to do with him, and she tells the gang to just play really old. Two policemen enter, and the gang instantly age 30 years right before our eyes, giving every old person stereotype shtick they can think of. I'm old. The detectives attempt to question the group about an illegal operation working out of this neighborhood, but Ida doesn't look up from her knitting, Fritzy pretends to be deaf, with Melba loudly trying to speak to her, Walter blasts the TV set, Harry starts talking about the time he had an operation, which is actually a really funny bit in the script, all while the detectives try unsuccessfully to question them. One of the officers has finally had enough of the cacophony and demands quiet. He tells them there's an illegal racket happening right here on this block. And they know that it's not a normal gang of thieves, it's a gang of kids. Well, that was a freebie. Sensing they're not going to get anything useful out of this group of geriatrics, the detectives let out a sigh and head out. After a pause, the gang slowly come out of their put-on theatrics and heave a collective sigh of relief. Everyone is still quite shaken from their close call with the law, and the gang start to wonder if they are pushing their luck and should maybe quit while they're ahead. After a long pause, Ida agrees that they should stop. After one last job. One last big score. She tells them she plans on buying the Sussex Arms. But Melba says it's already been bought by the people who bought the cornucopia. But Ida tells them that someone else put in a higher bid. Them. She says that she wants to do it for all the residents there, to have the pressure taken off them, to give them some security. Several of the Sussex Arms residents start to come into the lobby to ask about the cops being there and if everything's okay. Ida says everything's just fine and calls for all the residents to come into the lobby. The McGillhennies, the Whitakers, and all the residents enter and Ida asks how old they all are. They all shout out their various ages, 74, 73, 77, with Edna Whitaker giving a final 70. Ida says, if that's not a cue for a title song, I don't know what is. Lorraine? And they all sing 70 Girls 70. I took a shave and then a tub. I went down to the Friendship Club. The ladies came to a shrine. All hollering, this dance is mine. I danced with seven, maybe eight. I stayed till it was kind of late. And then I simply left the hall. I figured I'd prevent a brawl. And he was 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 at the time. Yes, he was 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. 70 girls. But really in my prime. 
The next scene is out of the story, back on the stage of the Broadhurst. Ida enters and tells the audience that everyone agreed to do the one last big job. But she says, before we get to that, I think we ought to talk about death. Do we have to? She says they've avoided talking about it up till then, so now she'd like to sing a death song. But don't worry, it's not your ordinary death song, she says. And Ida, with the help of Fritzy and Melba, sings the elephant song. Tell me how many graves have you seen so far When you're riding by in your motor car You can spot where all dead people are But here is what I'm dying to know Where does an elephant go? Where does an elephant go when an elephant gets old and gray that the poor thing's got to be put away? Well, if somebody knows, won't somebody say, where does an elephant go? Where does an elephant go? Back in the story, it's time for the last big job, and we're at the New York Coliseum for the International Fur Show. A watchman sits at his booth downstage left reading a newspaper when Harry, dressed in overalls and carrying a big cardboard box, enters and hands the watchman a slip of paper, asking him to sign for it. The watchman reads the slip for something called Quickie Disposable Units and checks his papers. I don't have any order for this, he says. Harry makes a bit of a scene and then says, fine, don't take them, no skin off my nose. But if they come screaming for them, you better tell them it's your fault. In fact, you better give me your name so my boss can have it. The watchman considers this all for a moment and says, ah, what the hell, and lets Harry in with the big box. As the watchman's booth goes off stage, Ida Gert, Eunice Walter, Fritzy, Melba, the McGillahennies, and the Whitakers all enter dressed in overalls as well, and a giant theater curtain made up of fur coats flies in. Harry sets the cardboard box down, over a trapdoor on the stage, and the gang get to work taking off every fur coat from the curtain and putting it into the seemingly bottomless box. When the last coat has been put in, the action freezes and a spotlight hits the watchman. He's on the phone with his boss asking if they were supposed to get a shipment of something called quickie disposable units. That's what I thought, he says. Sounded kind of fishy. That's not good. <laughs> hey. The light goes out on the watchman and the stage is dark, except for the gang's wilding flashlights as the lost group tries to find their way out. They can't go the way they came in, Ida says, so they won't pass the same watchman twice. Ida finally finds the door, but suddenly a loud police siren wails, and the footsteps and voices of security guards are heard clearly searching for the group. Ida tells everyone to run, and the McGillhennies and the Whitakers bolt for the exit. Ida tells the rest of the group to hurry. If she stays, at least the rest of them can get away. They all refuse to go without Ida, however, as the sound of footsteps are getting closer and closer. Ida promises them all that she has a way out and nothing is going to happen to her, but the rest of them have to run now. The gang all reluctantly leave and Ida calls the coppers over to her. The policemen run on, but are confused to find only one little old lady. Ida smiles at the audience, the story fades away, and we are back on the stage of the Broadhurst. Ida, all the way down to the footlights, says to the audience, now that's how it ends. I'm nabbed, arrested, busted. But I do have a way out, she says. I die. I walk behind that curtain, and I die. She says the script calls for it, and she always follows the script. She died? She died? Just, like, out of nowhere? But it's not all over yet, she adds. Something else happens in the next scene. Ida walks off and presumably dies, and a nicely dressed Fritzy, Melba, and Gert enter with Eunice, who is dressed in a beautiful wedding gown. The women talk about how they miss Ida for a bit, and then the wedding processional begins with the entire cast on benches facing upstage at the Reverend and Eunice and Walter, with the girls as her bridesmaids and Harry as his best man. Aww. The Reverend starts the service when Ida floats in on the moon and everyone freezes. Ida says she has come back because there was just one last thing she had to say to them, the sum total of what she's learned. Lorraine starts to play and Ida, with the entire company, sing the song, Yes. 
Yes, I can. Yes, I will. Yes, I'll take a sip. Yes, I'll touch. Yes, of course. Yes, why not? Yes, I'll happily thank you very much. Yes. Come on, say yes. Yes. Say yes. Yes. As the curtain falls after the final note, the gang all address the audience at once. Come back to the theater tomorrow night. Tell the box office guy you know me. Bring the kids, etc., etc. And Ida from the moon adding a final and go visit your grandmother. The end. The cast take their bows and sing a reprise of Old Folks. Go take a look at the old folks. They're quite an interesting sight. But if you want to see old folks, you're in the wrong place. Go call an usher. You got the wrong view. We're very sorry. You got the wrong group. Go get a refund. You're in the wrong think of 70 girls 70 it's a weird little show right i think it's sweet i mentioned at the top that this show boasts one of the craziest and saddest cast changes in history the show had its pre-broadway run in philadelphia and its cast featured legendary broadway funny man david burns david burns starred in dozens of classic musicals but was probably best remembered today for creating the roles of mayor shin in the music man Senex in a funny thing happened on the way to the forum and horace vandergelder in hello dolly yeah david burns was amazing he's an icon in 70 girls 70 he was performing the number go visit your grandmother on a march 14th performance when after delivering a funny line the veteran performer clutched his chest and collapsed on stage. The audience, being none the wiser, let out a big belly laugh, thinking the comedian was doing a bit. He was not, however. He was quickly rushed to the hospital, but 30 minutes after collapsing on stage, David Burns had died. The show was very quickly restructured, with Burns' character, that of a hotel clerk, now cut, and his songs reassigned, but the show, and the theater world in general, was never the same. Well, that was sad. The critics all had their major issues with the show. While most thought the score was wonderful, they all pointed out what a mess the book was with the very confusing switching between book scenes and vaudeville numbers. And I have to agree, shows have walked that line before with great success. Kander and Ebb's own Cabaret and Leader Chicago are prime examples of that. But with this show, it was never quite made clear where we were at any given point. And while the nonlinear songs in Cabaret and Chicago brilliantly comment on the action of the story, in 70 Girls 70, that's not always the case, making much of the evening feel a little random. If you remember Melba's line at the beginning of the show warning the audience that they have to pay attention or they'll be confused, yeah, that's not a good sign that your show is dramaturgically on the right track. You in danger, girl. By all reports, though, audiences who saw the show loved it, with enthusiastic applause and standing ovations. But the problems seem to be insurmountable. Besides the biggest issue of the structure of the show, there were two other major issues that put this old person musical into an early grave. Oof. One issue was that it was never intended to be a big, lavish Broadway musical, at least from Kander and Ebb's perspective. The show's early original director, Ron Field, was the driving force behind the Broadway ambition. We may be going to Broadway. What could have been a sweet, slight, odd little show playing off Broadway was ballooned up to Broadway proportions and not for the better. And to add salt to that wound, once the road to Broadway was set for the show, Ron Field up and bounced. Another issue was the timing. Earlier that same year, a smash hit revival of No No Nanette opened starring a group of Broadway royalty of yesteryear. Then, 70 Girl 70 opened 11 days after yet another show about old folks starring beloved performers from Broadway history with a sort of show within a show concept 
Stephen Sondheim's Follies. Son of a bitch. Yeah, I can't imagine a tougher act to follow. And it didn't go unnoticed by the authors either. Fred Ebb self-deprecatingly once equated 17 Girls 70 to Woolworths and Follies to Tiffany's. Ironically, Stephen Sondheim was reportedly a big fan of 70 Girls 70, which is a fun tidbit. But no amount of audience goodwill or even the adoration from Mr. Sondheim could save these old timers from eviction. After opening on April 15th, 70 Girls 70 closed one month later on May 15th, playing only 35 performances, the shortest of any Candor and Ebb show, and losing over $600,000, which today, with inflation, would be over $4.3 million. Yikes. It was produced in London's West End in 1991, 20 years after it premiered on Broadway, and starred Dora Bryan. For the London production, the show was brought back to its original intention with no big lavish sets, a small cast, greatly reduced orchestrations performed by a band of five musicians, and Fred Ebb enlisted librettist David Thompson to rework the book for the show, eliminating the out-of-story elements, making the evening much more straightforward. Thompson also added that the old folks are being evicted from the Sussex Arms, thereby upping the stakes and making the Robin Hooding a little more necessary. Another interesting change was that for the London audiences, it was requested by the producers that the stolen goods change from furs to jewelry to avoid any pushback from animal rights groups, which honestly, furs are gross, so good. Fur is murder! The score was restructured as well with three songs, The Caper, You and I Love, and The Elephant Song cut all together. Two new songs were added in, Well Laid Plans, and I Can't Do That Anymore. The London production of 70 Girls 70 went over much better with the critics than its American counterpart. A production of 70 Girls 70 was mounted as part of the wonderful City Center Encore series here in New York in 2006, starring, of course, a group of amazing character actors of a certain age, including George S. Irving, Charlotte Ray, Anita Gillette, Bob Dishy, and in the lead role of Ida, Olympia Dukakis, making her musical theater debut. I love her! I'm really curious to hear what you guys think of 70 Girls 70. Please let me know down in the comments. I love hearing from you guys and your opinions. If you liked this video and found some value in it, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. And better yet, share this video with the old person or old person at heart in your life. Of course, follow me on the socials at Bway Ghostlight and make sure and check out my Patreon page where, like I said, I'll have bloopers from this video. There have been a lot and more, plus members of a certain level get their beautiful names in each and every video. And those amazing folks in the producers tier also get to choose a show for an upcoming breakdown. I am truly thankful for all my patrons. Thank you all so much for watching and sticking around to the end. This is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Banani, and now turn off your TV and go visit your grandmother.